In collaboration with WTJX, the League of Women Voters of the Virgin Islands is pleased to present one-on-one -on -one interviews with candidates for the seventh legislative seat in the Virgin Islands from the St. Thomas St. John District. All candidates were contacted and invited to participate. Four either declined or did not respond to our invitation. I am Rosalie Simmons Ballantyne of the League of Women Voters. Today we are pleased to have Justin Harrigan Sr. for an interview. Welcome, Mr. Harrigan, and please introduce yourself to our voters. Thank you, Mrs. Ballantyne. My name is Justin Harrigan Sr., and I'm aspiring for that seventh seat in the St. Thomas St. John District. Okay, well, there is only one seat available. Only one person will be selected from the 13 aspirants. What are your unique characteristics that will encourage voters to select you over the other 12? Well, I would hope that they would realize, and I'm going to tell them now, that I served in the 31st legislature. I was there as a freshman. I, I was not successful in the election of 2016. However, because of the vacancy that has been created, I am now aspiring again for that seat to serve in the 32nd legislature to continue the work that I was unable to finish while serving there. I would like for the listening of you and audience to realize that I have on my platform, I'm a proven leader. It's not just a phrase. I have worked in the military three years, sergeant. I acquired the, the rank of sergeant. I came home. I worked at the Department of Human Services for 13 years. I instituted, formed, and directed the Fraud Prevention and Control Unit. I was the director of the Office of Veterans for Affairs for five years. And many other things that I've done in this community, as well as in the United States, particularly New York, where I work for the federal government, the Department of Social Security, and um, as an administrator there. Okay, well, as you just mentioned, you served in the 31st legislature. You ran on successfully in, in 2016. What are you saying to voters now that you think might make you successful in this? I'm election? saying to them... Please look at my record as a freshman senator. I did a tremendous amount of work, and I don't believe that the voters reviewed my record to see that I didn't just go there for the two years and sat around. I did major pieces of legislation, some of my own initiatives, as well as others that I co-sponsored with my colleagues. And I have voted on every measure that was voted upon in the 31st legislature. And I'm talking about over 200 pieces of legislation. Okay. I never abstained from any vote it's either yes or no. I scrutinized the proposed legislation. If in my estimation it was going to benefit the territory at large, the residents of this territory, mm -hmm. I voted yes. If I felt it was somewhat skewed to a select few and it was not in the best interest of the citizens of this territory, I voted no. Okay. So talking about what's yes, yes or no, you're your ability to say yes or no. <laughs> Are you in support of the syntax proposal? Yes or no? That's a very difficult question to answer, <laughs> yes or no. So I would need to expand on it. Oh, please go ahead. What I would say, uh, recognizing having been there as a senator in the 31st and hearing about the financial dilemma that the territory is in and what the bond market is requiring of this government, I could see why we had to pass some measure that created a revenue stream to satisfy the investors. The bond, the syntax, um, I would have preferred that there were some uh, uh, sunset clause in there where the people would understand that it was not for time in infinitum, that maybe five years, and after that, we would have established a revenue stream and go on to something else. But knowing the situation, knowing that if we can develop a stream, a revenue stream, to satisfy the bond market, recognizing the situation we're in financially, we're going to implode. Mm -hmm. So if I have to answer yes or no, I would say yes. It's one of those bills that you understand that it's going to hurt some people, but you, you have to look at the bigger picture. If we don't do this, what next mm -hmm. or what else? And that's my next question, mm -hmm. what else? What are some of your revenue and generating ideas for the territory? 
You know, it's interesting because I've been putting this out there for a number of years, okay? Um, I've traveled a lot in the United States, to so Europe as well, but particularly in the United States, most recently in Arizona, Florida, Washington, D.C., Chicago, particularly Florida and Arizona. Their weather is somewhat like ours. We have a lot of sunshine. Mm -hmm. We are retirement states or retirement uh, sites. We have what we call in the United States 55-plus uh, uh, communities. These are people who are age 55 and above, and they have these communities set up for them where you have individual homes, you have uh, community centers, you have grocery stores, you have uh, bowling alleys, all within this community for these individuals. The uniqueness about it is you don't have children running around making noise and so forth. So you finish work professionally, you want to live the rest of your days quietly, with, with uh, amenities that are necessary mm -hmm. for you. And I think that we, the Virgin Islands, should be promoting our weather. The weather that we have here lends itself to that type of uh, environment and that type of community. It's, there are many of these in, in, in Arizona, many in California. I'm particularly looking at St. Croix, where the land is somewhat flat, the topography is level, and the government has a tremendous amount of property over there. We should be encouraging investors to come to build these type of communities because we have residents that leave this territory for that type of living or lifestyle. We could probably hold them here or keep them here. Mm -hmm. Now, you're bringing investors in, but we would, the way we would help them would be to have them give access to the property, not all 100% tax exemption. They have to put something in the till. And I think that's one of the things that are hurting us. We're not getting enough taxation into the till. Mm -hmm. And um, the, yes, the investors come, but we give them 100% tax exemption in certain areas mm -hmm. for 30, 40, sometimes more than 40 years. Mm -hmm. Subsequently, our treasury is very, very low. Mm -hmm. And then we put the taxes on the smaller man and woman who lives in the community. And that becomes very frustrating for them. Now, that's an interesting proposal, but how does that generate rev how would that generate revenues if we're talking about retirees well you have the, the first of all you have the construction phase mm -hmm. you're going to create jobs mm -hmm. to build these communities once the communities are built and the residents come in this home ownership so they buy the homes they got to pay taxes property taxes the residents of these homes um, they're going to need maids they're going to need um, lawn more people to uh, how we call the culture to keep the place looking nice we're going to create jobs we have construction jobs which will be maybe twice as many as you need after the place is constructed you're going to have grocery stores in there you're going to have like i said bowling alleys you're going to have swimming pools all of these have to be maintained and all of these are creating jobs okay so tell me what do you see as the three primary issues facing the territory Three primary issues. I thank, thank God you only have three, because <laughs> there are more than three. Oh, for sure. Well, but let's say three top ones. Let us look at health care. I, as a senator, I've heard Mr. Wheatley from Roy Lester Schneider and the people from JFL on St. Croix continue to come to the Senate looking for subsidies from this government. I clearly remember when Wang, now, Roy Lester Schneider got something like $33 million dollars from our local government to keep them going. They're down to about 22 right now. The hue and cry is that they have this high uncompensated care, something like 72 to 73%, which means any and everyone with or without insurance have to go to the hospital, he or she must be treated. And I'm just wondering how are we gonna bridge that gap? We have the MAP program. We have um, the Medicare. I went to a doctor just yesterday. I spent $114 every month for Medicare. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the doctor didn't take my card. Mm. I went to the pharmacist. Most of the medication I had couldn't cover by Medicare. So we have to find an alternative way of insurance to protect these people that are um, without insurance to help the hospitals out. So that's one, health care. It's a major issue in this community. Um, crime, the criminal element. People blame the senators for everything. And I would tell them as they meet me in the street, senators provide the money for the department so that those commissioners and captains and lieutenants can do what's necessary. We are not the crime fighters. They are. 
They come, we question, they satisfy my questioning, I'm in favor of them getting the money to do what needs to be done. That's crime. And we could do better, but we're living in a small community as we are. The person that I have to pick up might be my cousin, my brother, a co-worker. So we have to create that sense of being that while he's my friend, while he's my brother, if he is accused of something and I have to arrest them, then that's in the, goes into the hands of the court and let them make the decision whether or not this person is guilty as charged. The other one is education. I remember going on a tour with uh, Commissioner McCollum back in 2015. We went to St. Croix where a couple of buildings were shuttered. The entire school complex was shut down. And I could not believe the condition that these buildings were in just two weeks prior. This was early July. They had just closed the, the school for the summer. And I could not believe the deplorable condition um, that these buildings were in. Um, at that time, she told us that they had a deferred maintenance bill of almost $74 million. So if they couldn't keep up with the regular maintenance every day, day-to-day -day maintenance, where are you going to get this $74 million in deferred maintenance? And the longer you wait, the worse the billing became. So I see those as the three major items up front, other than having an economic situation, which we have to address. But healthcare, crime, education. How would you address the economic situation? Well, I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again. We need to look at the EDA, EDC program. While it's a viable program, I know that we cannot reverse anything that we have done thus far because it's a contract we have signed with these individuals, these companies. But I'm saying going forward, mm -hmm. we, the government, need not, if we at all can, give 100% tax exemption in three areas, property, income tax, gross receipt tax, for 35, 40, 50 years. At some point in time, this company, this entity, should be showing a profit. And if they're so profitable, then we should be weaning them off of this subsidy that we are giving them for 40 years. Who remains in business if you're not profitable for 40 years? Doesn't make sense to me. I, uh, I questioned Mr. Biggs, who is the director of the EDA program, uh, when he was there before the Senate last year. Um, I noticed in his presentation, this the EDA program, I think, is about 15 or 16 years old in existence. And it was an, in that presentation that they were going to do an economic impact study to see how well the community has benefited from the EDA, EDC program. And I said, well, why 16 years later? That is something you should do in year three, year five, to see how well the community is benefiting from this program. Why now? 16 years later, you know? And like I said, I know we need to give some inducement for people to come, but everyone that comes to the territory is not offering the same economic package. If you're offering 20 jobs and I'm offering 10, because we both qualify, should I get 100% as well as you who are offering twice as many jobs? I don't think so. It should be on an individual basis. Not because you qualify, you get 100%. We should extrapolate what it is you're bringing to the territory and if it's good for us, rather than giving up so much. We can't do anything about what has been done over these 16 years, but I know Lime Tree Bay and St. Croix, the, the new Senepec storage a complex. This started at 25 years of tax exemption with an option of 15 more years. So that's 40 years that they will not be paying taxes in these three categories. I am saying if they begin to make money, where can we roll back the 100% to maybe 95 or 90 and let them put something in our, in our treasury so that we would have money to fix our schools, hire teachers, fix our roads. You know, trouble I got coming up here to get here. That's why I was so close to the time. <laughs> the potholes are so many that I couldn't, you know, I'm driving a regular truck. Is that a tank? A military <laughs> tank. So we got to do something, uh, Mrs. Valentine. Seriously. And we all have to share the burden. It can't just be the residents. Okay. It can't just be the residents. It has to be others who are coming to benefit from what they're bringing to us here in the territory. And we give them a lot, else they wouldn't come. Yeah. I thank you, Mr. Harrigan, for sharing your thoughts. That's the, that's the time? That's it. That's it. I thought that's it was 30 it. minutes. No, sir. How much time we had? 10 minutes. 10 minutes? 
<laughs> oh my God. We thank you for sharing, Mr. Herrick, we thank you for sharing your thoughts with our voters. And we thank you, WTJX, for this time.